Thank you, Chuck. Well, I have three friends here this morning who are from Green Bay, Wisconsin. And they have uh, come to visit with us and to, uh, to worship with us this morning. And it means more to me than I can say. It just, it's just lovely that uh, people from a former church would, would come and continue uh, worshiping with me and with you. And, and I welcome them. I won't, I won't necessarily point them out because that would embarrass them. But, but they are in this middle section here, <laughs> about halfway up. And, it, <laughs> and I'll just let you figure it out from there. But uh, let me just say that it, it uh, means an awful lot to me. Uh, I was thinking, I, I, I had received message earlier in the week that they would be here, and, and it got me thinking because uh, I was the interim minister in a church in Green Bay right before I came here. And it was at this time last year that I was serving that church in Green Bay. And uh, actually, then the more I got to thinking about it, I, I went, uh-oh, uh-oh. It was exactly this week, a year ago, that I was making my way from where I lived in small town America. It was about an hour to Green Bay. And, and so as I was making my way down Highway 32, just south of Hilbert, I'm sure you all know where that's at. Uh, I, I was uh, thinking about the church and all the issues they were facing, and I, I was mulling this over, and, and um, I, I, I suppose I wasn't fully attentive to the road. And so I took a peek around this semi-trailer truck, this Mack semi-trailer truck, and I pulled out to pass, and I went on up. And I was about parallel with the cab, you know, and, well, let's just say for brevity's sake, we had a rude introduction, because that, that Mack truck decided to turn left just as I was passing. And, um, well, my Jeep was totaled, but what was really damaged was my ego. My ego, because I, I had figured that, you know, that, that this was an open passing lane, and I, I discovered that actually my vision was less than perfect, and my ego took a hit. I, I got a new Jeep. Uh, the vision is still less than 2020. I'm afraid to tell you. But it's good to know the difference because things aren't always the way they appear. Like that airplane that was en route and both engines quit and it started down. And there were five people aboard, but only four parachutes. And they quickly started to talk among themselves. And, and, and one fellow said, well, he was a world-class cardiologist, and he was going to be performing uh, this groundbreaking surgery this next week, and that it would save a lot of lives. And, so they decided to give him one of the four parachutes. Another man popped up and said that he was a bishop and he was about to preach Sunday, Easter Sunday sermon at this church and it would change lots of lives and have great impact around the world. And they decided to give him a parachute and he, he jumped as well. This other man quickly jumped up and he said he was the smartest man in the whole world and that the world needed his brilliance. And so he grabbed a parachute and he jumped. Well, that left this woman and this high school boy and they looked at each other and she said, 
I want you to take this parachute and go. And he said, oh no, ma'am. He said, I, I, I can't do that. You take it. And she said, no, I've lived a good life. You're so young and you've got so much life ahead of you. I want you to take this parachute. And he said, well, ma'am, I've got a parachute. And she said, what? He said, yeah, that smart man took my backpack. <laughs> Have you ever noticed how appearances can be deceiving? <laughs> you know, like you, you're thinking something is one thing and it turns out to be another. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah. It's like that afternoon when Jesus came riding into town on his borrowed burrow. He didn't look much like the long-awaited Messiah. In fact, chances are he looked more like some homeless person down on his luck rather than the long-awaited kingly figure from the line of David. His mode of transportation was a busted-down jackass which someone didn't even care to keep a close eye on instead of some majestic war horse which would seem more fitting for the coming king. Jesus had no powerful army that would come to liberate the Jews from the oppression of the Romans and establish the long-awaited kingdom of God. The only army that Jesus had was some comical collection of flea-bitten, dusty, ragtag bunch of farmers and fishermen. You certainly wouldn't have guessed, would you, that this Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, the coming king who had the power to set Israel free. Jesus and his entrance into Jerusalem is described by Matthew as the long-awaited coming of Zion's king. You see, this was the moment that the people's hopes and dreams were based on. They had been waiting for that moment, and it had finally come. And there was great joy and excitement because they saw this Jesus as the one who would finally liberate them from oppression. The Jews believed that this moment was their moment, and it had finally arrived in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. The crowds came out to greet him, and they believed that the time was at hand when this Messiah would finally establish his just and fair kingdom for all, not just the well-positioned and privileged. But little did they know, little did they know how their hopes would soon be frustrated by a dark turn of events. The chief priests and the rulers of the synagogue were infuriated by Jesus' attacks on the way they ran the temple for their own selfish gain and power. When he drove out the money changers and the buyers and sellers, he ignited the anger of the Jewish leaders and this, this was the beginning of the end. Or so it seemed, because you know how appearances can be deceiving. Now this season, they were celebrating the Passover. And what was usually 40,000 people in Jerusalem had swelled to 200,000 as people came from all the little towns to Jerusalem. And the Romans were on guard because it was the Passover, don't you see? The Passover for Jews was the, the feast they would celebrate every year, celebrating their release 
from slavery in Egypt and their trek to the promised land. It was this Passover that God had carried them through. And now they found themselves enslaved and under the thumb of the Roman oppression. It was a tinderbox that all that it would ever take would be a spark to explode this. And as 200,000 Jews gathered in Jerusalem, you could see that there was trouble on the horizon. And with Jesus coming down the dusty trail from the Mount of Olives to Jerusalem on this borrowed burrow, and people cheering him on and throwing their coats and waving palm branches. The celebration had begun and there was no telling where this would end. The Romans and the Jewish leaders were on edge because you could feel the tension and you could know that the old order was about to change. No longer would it be business as usual because when it comes to God's kingdom, it's not about the well-positioned and privileged. It's about the poor and the needy. And this is what Jesus stood for. This is what Jesus was coming to clash with the leaders about. By Thursday, after the Passover meal, Jesus would be betrayed by one of his own, Judas, and taken by soldiers who had been sent to arrest him. In the course of the trial, he would be questioned by the high priest and found guilty of blasphemy. He would be transferred to the Romans, who were the only ones who had the power to execute the final solution. The Roman governor Pontius Pilate would declare that he found no fault in Jesus. In fact, Pilate wanted to release him. But the mob, the mob had gathered to watch the events unfold and they began to cry, crucify him, crucify him. In the end, Pilate would yield to their demands. Not exactly what you would have expected from this coming king. But then again, appearances can be deceiving. From the point of view of those who had been his followers, Thursday was a dark and terrible day. It looked as though everything for which they had hoped was now lost. The disciples abandoned Jesus and fled. The shouts of Hosanna had now turned to cries of crucify him. And as you know, he died on a cross and was buried in a borrowed tomb. But not even that was as it appeared. The tomb, the place of permanence where his body was deposited, would turn out to be just a temporary place of holding. But as you can see, all of these events were put into play when Jesus came riding down on that little donkey. Something significant was about to take place. There would be that clash between the kingdom of this world and Jesus' kingdom. The people shouted, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! And it appeared as they laid their coats and their branches on the, on the way, constructing something of a kingly carpet, it would appear that they were willing also to lay down their lives for him. Or so it would seem. Would they truly follow him down the path of discipleship? A few days later, their faith would be put to the test. 
They would have to decide if they saw things as they wanted them to be or as they really were. This king and his kingdom had a different look to it, not the one they were expecting. But then that's often the way God works. We expect one thing and God gives us another. We want what we want. God gives us what we need. I'll be honest with you. I often ask myself, would I have recognized Jesus for who he was? You know, if I was one of those standing there on the side of the road as he passed by, and as I was shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Would I have really understood who this king was? Would it have been the king that I wanted him to be? Or the one that he really was? I wonder if we would have seen him for the Savior who would bring change from the inside out. Would we have recognized Jesus as the servant king he was and his kingdom of concern for the lost and lonely? Or would we have wanted just a new rearrangement of the chairs of political power? Would our vision have been any better? It's hard to tell. Because, you know, appearances can be deceiving. Maybe the more important question isn't whether we would have recognized Jesus on the road that day, but how we see him today. Do we understand the paradox that Jesus presents us with of being first by being last, of gaining our lives by giving them away, of leading by serving, of finding love by loving others and caring for the poor and the needy here, next door, and around the world? To serve this king, my friends, is to serve those who are hungry, thirsty, naked, sick, and lonely. Not says Jim, so says Jesus. And he says that it is to these and to us who are willing to care for these beloved children of God that the kingdom of heaven arrives and truly sets us free. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. May God bless you. And may God bless United Church of Marco Island.